Let me tell you what I learned from Azazel about the nature of spirits. It's a fact. You're able to receive answers to any questions that you have, as well as clearly see events at a distance or even in other dimensions. That in mind, I have to ask you, why aren't you taking advantage of this godlike power? Either you've already mastered the godlike power of omniscience, or you're waiting for a personal invitation to embrace your ability to know anything instantly. So here it is. Start watching the Mastering Divination Omniscience training course now. And if it isn't everything that I promise it is, you don't have to pay a dime for it. You can check that out at becomealivinggod.com slash masteringdivination. A couple years ago, strange and interesting events led me to make a pact with Azazel, leader of the fallen angels, chief of evil chiefs. For 90 days I evoked Azazel each day, spending hours learning directly from him about evocation, magic, rituals, and about the nature of reality itself. What he told me specifically about spirits forced me to rethink how I viewed spirits, and actually, it made me rethink the way I viewed just about everything. Up until that moment, I thought, as most people do, the spirits are exactly what they appear to be. The bodies that they show up for in an evocation are what they hang out at at home wearing. I thought that they must sit around on the astral plane doing whatever it is that they do until a red light buzzes over the door, letting them know that they've been evoked. I think that a good deal of my naive understandings about spirits came from a misconception that they exist in the same time-space context as we humans do. I'm lucky that Azazel cleared this up for me. Now, the debate on this subject has always had two sides. Either spirits are real, or they aren't. It seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, it's actually not. In fact, I'm pretty certain when a debate is going that if there are only two sides to uh, the opposing arguments, then both of them are wrong, because everything exists in degrees, rather than in complete polarities. So in order to clear this up, I asked Azazel, where do you come from? Keep in mind that this single question is possibly the one that spirits avoid the most intensely. While Azazel's reply was definitely cryptic, he answered my question in much more depth than any other spirit has. I am the formed abyss. We are not different. All things are formed from one primordial nothingness, not at some point in the distant past, but in each moment. Every moment that you consider me, I come into being. Every moment that you consider yourself, you were brought into existence. Stop considering yourself and you will cease to be. I have appeared to men as they have considered me. I taught them that which they were on the brink of learning themselves. I concatenated their realizations. I would say that I have always existed as the Promethean Pandorian figure because all time for me is present. However, I have not existed at all until this moment, but neither have you. I wasn't about to let him off that easily, so I continued to ask him, where does that leave the idea of objective reality? His answer actually seemed to return to the idea of Maya, of all things existing as a great illusion. Reality is far from objective. Can you name a single thing that exists independent of your observation? Such a thing does not exist. When you and I meet, you and I come into existence. Until that point, there is no you, there is no I. You exist only in your relation to that which surrounds you. Your very physical form is held together, as mine is in this smoke, by the pressure inside of your skin meeting the pressure outside of your skin, and both forces holding you in one piece. This is a type and a shadow of the whole of existence. Only through application of various forces of pressure does anything exist. You have learned to master some of these pressure systems and can apply them to summoning forth something from nothing to speak to you. You ask if I am real? I am as real as the world around you, which is not real at all. For almost a century now, occultists have debated whether spirits are real or if they're part of the human psyche projecting itself as a sort of hallucination. What Azazel is saying, and what I now consider to be the most accurate thought on this matter, is that spirits are both at the same time. Here's what I know for a fact. When I perform an evocation, a spirit appears before me. I can see it, I can hear its voice, I can smell whatever scent it brings with us, and often that odor is so profound that I can even taste it. As it enters the room, I can feel it, the shifting of the astral winds around me, and if I'm daring enough, I can reach out and touch it. 
To all of my senses, the spirit is real. It's as solid as the floor beneath me and the walls around me, and even more substantial because it is also interacting with me internally through telepathic image transfer, through intuitive, intuitive processing, so that on top of all of my senses telling me that it's real, every fiber of my being confirms it. To prove that it's not just me falling deeper into my own insanity, I've taught thousands of other people how to evoke in the same manner with the same results. And they witness the materialization of entities in front of them as solid as I do, and usually with very similar if not identical attributes for certain spirits. So once contact is made with the spirit, it becomes undeniably real. Before the spirit is brought into materialization, there is no evidence, personal or otherwise, that the spirit exists at all. The power of the spirit, as well as the unique consciousness of it, exists, but it's only through evocation that we, as magicians, give it some sort of form. We're able to take the raw, nebulous force and intelligence and condense it into a shape in front of us, which we can interact with as easily as you can with another person. However, we're not doing any of this consciously. We don't necessarily push the materialization of the spirit into a particular form, like a raven or a blonde-robed humanoid. When we enter the necessary psychological and physiological states during the ritual of evocation, our individual mind begins to sync with the omnipresent and omniscient field of consciousness itself. The attributes of the spirit are very specific, and that specific archetypal pattern relating to the nature of the spirits and the character of the spirit triggers within us correlating forms and images. Through the various operations that bring the spirit into materialization then, evocation brings the spirit into, materi in, into materialization in coordination with these attributes. Think about what you're actually doing in evocation then. You're altering your observation of reality to the, to the degree of producing a materialization of a spirit that all of your senses can verify is real. Utilizing the momentum of, of that great alteration of observation, you are then imprinting on the whole of reality a change that you want to create. This is why evocation itself is so powerful, because you're literally materializing an impossibility into beholdable form. And you can then send your requests upon the wake of that ripple in reality so that the fulfillment of your desire becomes embedded in the very fabric of your observation of reality. Keep in mind that none of this means the spirits don't exist independent of us, but that they are intelligent power and active consciousness, extreme currents running through the fifth dimensional field of consciousness. Until the moment of evocation though, they are entirely unusable and basically irrelevant to human life. Through evocation, we are calling these currents and powers into our life in the most concrete way. Of course, what's brought me to these conclusions hasn't been from the collection of other people's opinions or by the academic study of the subject, but by actually evoking, by working with the spirits directly and regularly over the space of 20 years. Because of this, I can't ask you to take my word for any of this. Instead, I invite you to jump into your own practice of evocation, to begin to interact with spirits directly and regularly, and see what conclusions you reach about them, and then I'd love to compare notes with you. And if you're struggling with mastering the practice of evocation, or if you've already had a good grasp on it, but think that you're ready to take it to the next level, then you owe it to yourself to check out my Mastering Evocation training course, which is going to be available on July 17th at becomealivinggod.com slash mastering evocation. We'll talk again soon.